So today we're going to be taking a look at this Resolute machine on Hack the Box and we're going to be getting the user and the root flag. Now as you can see I've already done this so you're not going to have to sit through every painstaking minute of me figuring out how to do everything but this isn't going to be just a, a quick sort of type this, click that and then you've got the root flag. This is going to be an explanation. I'll go into quite a lot of detail about how I've done things, how I've figured things out. So this is more aimed at people that want to learn things rather than just want to get the root flag and get the points. So as usual, the first thing we're going to do is an Nmap scan. So if we do the first 6,000 ports, it's kind of my favorite thing to just start things off. Um, and then if we struggle, we'll do the rest, but it takes a long time to do them all uh, over the VPN. So for now, we'll just do T4, which makes it slightly faster essentially. And we'll do dash V for the verbose output so that we can see what's going on. Um, I'll skip ahead to once this is completed so that you don't have to sit and wait for this. All right, so that has finished now, and we can see we've got this list of open ports. Now, the interesting ones are 389 for LDAP, which means Active Directory, and 53 for DNS, which again hints that this is a domain controller for Active Directory, along with all the global catalog ports for LDAP as well, and then also the PowerShell remoting port. So they're the interesting ones, oh, and also 445 for probably an SMB share. Uh, if we try and go to the SMB share now, we'll just get prompted for credentials because we don't have any at the moment. If we try and log in to uh, PowerShell at the moment remotely, we then to PS session, we will see that we are denied access because we don't have any credentials. So that kind of just leaves LDAP to look at. So if we use LDP, um, which is a built-in Microsoft tool, so we can go to connect and we can put in the server's IP address and we'll see a lot of information about the, the root directory object, um, including the domain name, so we know that the domain name is called megabank.local and in LDAP queries the um, domain name needs to be formatted like this so if we do a search now um, if we search and use that format that dc equals megabank dc equals local um, as the root and just search for all users click run and we get a load of user accounts now if we look through all this information um, we'll eventually find one that has a password mentioned in their description. There we go, so description on this account, this Marco account, um, says account created, password set to welcome123. Now I saw somebody on the forum saying that's very unrealistic, but you'd be amazed how many people think that only administrators can access anything in Active Directory. Whereas right now we're connected with a completely anonymous user, we don't even have any credentials, we can see all this stuff. Now I don't think that's the default, I don't think normally an anonymous user can see stuff in Active Directory, but any normal user account, someone who just logs on to the domain, a normal legit user that shouldn't have any admin permissions, they can see all of this. But you'd be surprised how many people think that normal users can't view any of this. So yeah, some admins do store stuff like this in the description of user accounts, which is kind of crazy. Now the first thing would be to try this password, this welcome123 exclamation mark, with this user account. Um, the sum account name attribute stores the username, so that is his username. But if we try and use that, um, the credentials don't work. So the next step was to try that password with some other user accounts. And long story short, it turns out that that password works with an account called Melanie. The way I've sort of narrowed this down a bit, because there's a lot of user accounts, was to just um, do an LDAP query. Well, don't know what that's doing. Uh, to just do an LDAP query that checks to see um, if this last logon timestamp attribute has a value, basically. Because um, if we do that, now we only get... How many user accounts do we get? Now we only get four um, user accounts back. One of them is a computer, actually, as well. So we've only got three accounts to try that password with. Actually, that one's a computer as well. So we've only got two accounts to try that password with. We've got Ryan and Melanie. Um, I tried it with Ryan, didn't work. I tried it with Melanie, and it did work. So now we can do... Enter PS session with a credential Melanie, because that was her username that we got from uh, the Sam account name property there on her account. And we'll type in welcome123 exclamation mark, and it should let us in. There we go, that has let us in. Um, so we can see the files and folders in there. So if we go to her desktop folder, we should be able to get the user flag straight from there. There we go. So you can do git content 
user.txt, and you'll see the user flag. So that is a pretty, pretty easy um, user flag, to be honest. So for the root flag, we're still logged in as this um, session as Melanie on this machine. And if we go into the C drive and look around, obviously I'd look through all the program files and everything like that. But if we look around in here, do ls-force to show hidden files, and we find this folder called PS Transcripts, which is a hidden folder. We didn't find that normally when we just do ls. Um, so we want to have a look in there because that's not a standard folder that I've seen before. Um, so we'll go into there, do ls again. Obviously this is all a bit slow. Um, although it's saying there's nothing in there, ah, because it's also hidden. So we can do force, um, cd into that. And then ls again. Again, it must still all be hidden files in here. Yeah, so now we have this um, PowerShell transcript thing. So if we just get the content of that, read that out, we can see somewhere in here we have a password. We have, um, here we go, value, cmd, net use, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Ryan is the username, and that is his password. So we're going to copy that and We'll set Ryan as the username so that we know what that's for. Um, so now if we log out of here, we don't really need to be logged in as Melian anymore. We can try these uh, credentials for Ryan. So we're going to do the same thing. I'm very lazy with typing, so I'm going to go back to this. And we're going to do end PS session again, but now try Ryan's credentials. Paste his password in that we just got. And we'll see if that lets us in. And we've hit a bit of a roadblock because I think the server might be currently being reset. But we'll wait for that to come back up and then we'll try again. Uh, yeah, if we go to the Hack the Box site, we can see someone did just issue a reset on this machine. So that is why. Sometimes you do have to watch out for things like that. Um, it's probably a good idea to have this um, shout box up when you're attacking a machine, because then it will pop up and alert you if someone's resetting each machine. Um, but yeah, so let's try again now that the machine is up. We'll put its password in, and we see now it does actually let us in. So we can do ls in Ryan's folder. Um, so first thing we would do is just look on the desktop and see if you know, there's any um, interesting thing in there. There is this note, but it doesn't actually say anything interesting. I don't really know why it's in there, but yeah, it is. Um, so as Ryan, what we can do is who am I such all, and we'll see all the groups that he's a member of. And one thing that stands out is that he's a member of the DNS admins group. Although I can't see it in here. Where are we? There we are. Megabank slash DNS admins. Another way you could figure this out um, is to do a search for Ryan. Oops, wrong button. Um, if we search for Sam account name equals Ryan, um, and then we'll be able to see in his member of attribute, he's a member of contractors. And then if we look at contractors, um, we would see that they are a member of DNS admins. Contractors, member of DNS admins group. So he's like indirectly a member of uh, the DNS admins group. There are other tools that make it a lot easier and quicker to see group membership like that. Um, but yeah, that's one way of doing it. That's pretty weird to see someone be a member of DNS admins, to be honest. Like it's not a very commonly used group um, because generally people are just admins. It's pretty rare you have someone that only administers DNS unless you're in an absolutely huge organization. So that straight away gives us a tip that um, that's probably what we should be looking at. So with that in mind, I started Googling around, searching online for exploits for the NS admins group, like privilege escalation, how to get um, domain admin access or local system access or anything from being in the DNS admins group. And what I found was this. This particular blog post here had a lot of good information in. And essentially, it gives you a proof of concept. Um, it explains exactly how they found this, this bug, although is technically called a feature, not a bug, for some reason. Um, and basically, what we need to do is run the DNS CMD EXE program, which is a way of interfacing with the DNS um, service. The DNS service runs as um, administrator, not administrator, sorry, local system. So basically, what you do is run this um, built-in Windows tool um, and tell it to load this server plugin DLL. Uh, again, this blog post, which I'll leave a link to in the description, does a great job of explaining exactly how and why this works. But essentially, all you need to know is that you can specify a path to a DLL, and the DNS service will launch or load that DLL uh, when it starts. So we can abuse that um, to basically load any code we want as local system. 
So they've again given a great example of how to do that. It is C++ though, um, because it needs to be a native C++ or C DLL, um, which I've got zero experience with C++ pretty much, um, other than some very brief stuff on like an Arduino. Um, so I took the plunge and decided to try and write my own DLL um, that does everything we need. I'll apologize to anyone who is a C++ developer because this is going to look horrendous, my code, but I did the best I could. So as long as these three functions are exported from our DLL, and again, I'm very new to C++, so I had to learn all this on the way, um, this is the correct way to export them um, in the correct format that, that basically the DNS service is looking for. I did it slightly differently to how they did in this blog post because this wouldn't work for me doing it this way. So yeah, this is what I had to do. Basically, when the DNS service starts, it will load the DLL and call this function in it. And again, remember, this is going to be running as local system on the domain controller. So what we can do is place some code in that function. So if we go to this function, this is where it's actually implemented. If we run this function that I've written up here, it's going to, again, I did a really bad job of this. It's just me throwing together what I could in C++. Um, instead of starting like a remote shell and all that complication, I just decided to loop through um, the obvious names for the root flag. So because I wasn't sure exactly what they would have named the file, it just loops through these three um, just to make sure we get it. It turns out it is actually just root.txt on the administrator's desktop. Uh, so basically it loops through those files, it gets the file contents from each one, um, and if it actually did successfully get the contents, it writes it out to this temporary file location. Again, it's not pretty, and it's, there's a million better ways of doing it, but it took me so long just to get the hang of C++ in general, just to even write this, that at that point I was like, you know what, let's just do it as simple as possible and not add any extra complications. So after I'd done all that and tested it on my own test VM, um, compiled this, um, made sure it's targeting 64-bit platform because the server is 64-bit, and then copy it over to the uh, remote machine, and we'll just stick it in the temp folder here temporarily. And the way I like to do that is um, by using the PowerShell copy item command and copying to the PowerShell session. Right, so if we um, do new PS session and connect to that server with those credentials of Ryan's, and then what we need to do is copy our DLL to that session. So if we do copy item, and uh, we want to do two session, copy it to that session that we just created. And the source is going to be where I've copied my DLL to. And then the destination is going to be on that server. We'll just stick it in um, Ryan's user folder again. My bad, it's not source, it's path. There we go just when I thought I started to get the hang of PowerShell commands. So like I say, that is copying the DLL that we've written here into this folder, and then we're gonna use that DNS CMD uh, program, which like I say, is a built-in part of Windows to basically tell the DNS service to load our DLL when it starts. And then we'll just have to restart the DNS service and it should load our DLL as system, run this function to read the file, output it to this file, and then we'll be able to see the root flag in there. Again, it's a bit of an unconventional way of doing it. I know most people would figure out how to get it to start a remote shell and just browse around manually, but this is this is what I came up with. So now we just do enter PS session um, and enter that session that we just created. Just make sure that the uh, file is in there. Yeah, so there we go. So now we do DNS CMD, um, config, server level plugin, DLL, you can tell I've done this plenty of times because I'm so used to typing that. Um, and we're going to tell it to load that file. And um, DNS plugin DLL. So that's saying that it successfully completed it. So now we just need to restart the uh, DNS service. See so it's stopped pending. Just make sure it's actually stopped. No, it says it's running now. <laughs> bit weird. The problem is on this server, when multiple people are attacking it at once, you get, for a start, you can only have one of these DLLs loaded at once, or one of these DLLs kind of linked in the registry at once. So if somebody else runs that command now, it'll overwrite my path there and this won't work. But also people are constantly trying to restart the DNS service. So it 
gets pretty messy. I'm kind of surprised it was allowed because generally they say um, you, know, you can't have anything else. You know, it says it stopped. This is weird. Um, but if we just do start DNS, hopefully it will actually start now. Um, yeah, I'm kind of surprised it was allowed because they generally say you can't have a service that um, or a, a feature that needs like just one person to be attacking it at once. So you see at the moment it hasn't created our um, text file, but this was very odd the way this stopped and started, so I'm not sure. And again, somebody else could have overwritten our, um, our thing here. So we'll try that again. Just make sure I've got the path correct. Uh, Ryan, update local temp DNS plugin. Yeah, that is all correct. Okay, well I'm really confused by this because I've literally done, I've just checked my, um, my write-up and I literally did the exact same command um, and then it worked. So... <laughs> right, so now it's worked. I don't understand what I just did differently. I must have had a typo in this. App data, local, temp, DNS plugin deal. Like, I'm, am I being blind here? Surely the capitalization doesn't matter. Maybe it does. Maybe that actually has to be a lowercase r. Because I, I checked my um, write-up just to make sure I wasn't being stupid here, and it does have a lowercase r there. Maybe it's case-sensitive because it's a, a C... No, but the file system isn't case-sensitive. That is bizarre to me. Let me know in the comments if you can see what on earth I was doing wrong in this command where it didn't work compared to this command where it has worked perfectly. So again, just to clarify, we loaded the, we well, told it to load the DLR when it starts, and we stopped the DNS service, made sure it is actually stopped, started the DNS service, and then now it has created this um, temp file that we wanted. So if we do a GC and read the contents of that, it has got the user flag that it read from, um, oh, so the root flag, not the user flag, that it read from the root um, text file. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of annoyed that that didn't go more smoothly, but what are you going to do? But yeah, that just goes to show, I guess, that sometimes you have everything correct and it still doesn't work and you have to just kind of keep trying and just tweaking stupid things like case sensitivity, which I still don't think that can be the issue, but I just can't see anything else different because Windows doesn't normally ever care about case sensitivity and file paths. But either way, um, let me know what you thought of the video, what you thought of this machine. I, I really liked it. Um, I definitely learned a thing or two about this um, whole DNS service setup and it seems pretty weird to me that you can do this and Microsoft says it's not a bug or a security issue but yeah we basically elevated from DNS admins group to local system which on a DC means we can do anything and make ourselves domain admin if we wanted to pretty much so yeah it's a bit of a strange one but yeah uh, whichever box I end up doing next I will see you in that video.